Diabetes and Prevention uh, Medical Director for Intermountain Employee Health. Um, Dr. Carroll will give us a kind of a brief overview. Then we're, then we're also pleased to be joined by the Utah legislators um, from the Southern Utah area, uh, Senator Don Ibsen, Senator Evan Vickers, uh, Rep Representative Walt Brooks, Representative Brad Last, Representative Travis Signeller, Representative Rex Ship, and Representative uh, Lowry Snow. Each of, the, each of these gentlemen will give a, a brief comments after Dr. Carroll. Then we'll have Dr. Dascom give us an update on the vaccine rollout and how that's going. And then we'll open up for questions. So um, let me, we will be recording this as we typically do and I'll provide those, uh, that recording and the links afterwards. But uh, let's go ahead and uh, start with Dr. Carroll. Excellent, thanks Lance. Um, thanks everybody for, uh, for joining us today and um, especially like to, um, Share my, share my thanks and gratitude for our, our local legislators that are, are here to join with us as we um, share a message about COVID with the, with the community. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the community for, um, for the efforts that are, are underway that uh, people are doing uh, to spread the, decrease the spread of COVID. Um, let me focus on one particular thing. Um, we all anticipated there would be a, a surge in COVID cases after the Thanksgiving holiday. And um, we're pleased to see that that surge that we expected didn't occur in the way that we thought it, it would. And that's, that tells me that we have a significant percent of our population in Southern Utah that did follow the, the recommendations of, of um, our government officials, of our healthcare officials, and of our local mayors um, as we met before Thanksgiving to encourage and ask the community to, to celebrate Thanksgiving holiday with their individual families rather than the extended families and friends. Um, a thank you to the members of the community that, that did that. Thank you to the members of the community that followed those recommendations, followed that advice uh, so that we can um, prevent hospitalizations and prevent uh, negative outcomes among some that we are seeing that, that, have, uh, that uh, do get COVID. Um, what you're doing is making a difference, and um, and that's really really important. And we're extremely grateful from the hospital standpoint. Um, and our goal is to help everybody live the healthiest life possible. Um, I want to to take just a minute as well to share um, some information about uh, COVID testing with the Intermountain testing site. And there will be some uh, some limited hours during the during the Christmas holiday and New Year's holiday. Um, and if we haven't sent this out already, I'm sure we can send it to you with specifics. But Christmas Eve, the Southwest Utah sites uh, will open at the regular times on Thursday, December 24th, and they'll close at noon. On Christmas Day, all of our Southern Utah um, testing sites will be closed. Um, the day following Christmas, on the 26th of December, all sites will have regular hours um, on December 26th. Then on New Year's Eve, uh, will be regular hours, but New Year's Day, the sites will be closed. So no Intermountain testing sites in Southwest Utah open on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. Um, we will be open Christmas Eve and the day following Christmas and limited hours on, on Christmas, Christmas Eve. Uh, and those are all available on the uh, Intermountain website, intermountainhealthcare.org uh, slash COVID testing. Um, from a hospital standpoint, um, it was a bit sobering this morning when I um, checked our, our COVID numbers and, and unfortunately we once again um, set a, another uh, record number of hospitalizations um, with 67 uh, COVID positive patients in the, uh, admitted to the hospital um, in St. George. Um, our ICU census, we've shared with, um, with uh, our local media that our ICU, we have 32 ICU beds. Um, we currently have 37 ICU patients, which means that um, we uh, continue to um, have ICU patients outside of our regular ICU um, and being staffed by ICU nurses. Um, so, you know, we're, we're continuing to find ways to treat each patient that needs care um, in the hospital. But we also need to recognize that this is contingency care, that we're not in our, um, that we're not providing the normal care for ICU patients in the normal place that, uh, that we would, 
who would like to provide the care. Um, uh, somewhat sobering as I as I continue to follow our uh, our hospitalizations and uh, some of our our metrics here here in St. George is we have seen some ups and downs um, in the in the number of of hospitalizations. Overall, the trend of hospitalizations has been down, and uh, notwithstanding today our our number is the highest that it's uh, that it's been. Our overall seven day average is not at the highest level that it's been. Um, we see a we see a trend where the number of cases increases, followed by the number of hospitalizations that increases, followed by a number of ICU uh, COVID hospitalizations increasing, and unfortunately, um, that's often followed by an increase in the number of of COVID um, of deaths in the in the hospital from COVID from our COVID patients. Um, uh, last week, as I as I tracked our our numbers and followed those along, um, we uh, we exceeded an average of two and a half um, inpatient COVID deaths per day uh, for a rolling seven day period. Um, that's a pretty humbling uh, humbling statistic. It's something that that we were worried about as the cases increased. We were worried that um, this is something that may that may occur. We were hoping we did every, we continue to do everything we can to prevent any any death, whether it's a COVID related death or or otherwise, and um, despite the the best efforts of our our team and the excellent care that our um, ICU and, um, physicians and nurses and respiratory therapists provided, um, we we continue to have have patients and individuals, um, our friends and neighbors in our in our community, that are not surviving um, their COVID illness. Um, the work that's being done to prevent spread of disease will translate into um, decreased hospitalizations and will translate into, into decreased deaths. Um, I do want to, uh, you've heard before and I'll reiterate that our, our caregivers are, um, particularly the nursing staff is exhausted in what they're doing. We've brought in extra help, we appreciate the extra help, um, but they're committed. They're committed to providing the best care they can to every single patient. Um, in the hospital, we'll continue to do that. Let me just finish with with one more one more statement of appreciation, um, not just for the community, but um, but to the um, to our elected officials that are on this call. Uh, nearly every elected official on this call has um, accepted the invitation to come and and tour the hospital with our with our leadership team to see firsthand um, the impact of COVID in the in the hospital. And they've asked very good questions. Um, they've sought clarification on on um, items that that have been floating around in the community, and we really appreciated the opportunity to have those conversations. And we appreciate the um, how sincerely our um, legislators care about the local community and our state community uh, as we continue to to work through this pandemic. So, um, just sincere gratitude to and. Um, to our uh, our elected officials as we as we partner together and to do this work and i'll um i'll pause there and um lance transition back back to you for an um, introduction and um, and statements from our uh, our legislators thanks dr carroll okay let's go ahead and start with uh senator don ipson and then uh, we'll have uh, Senator Evan Vickers re uh, after him. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to be with you folks and share a few minutes with you. It, this, is a, this is a troubling time that we've been through. And, you know, we worked hard to, President Adams, the president of the Senate, has, has kind of led out with this from a political standpoint to help guide the process that kept us so that we were healthy, but yet didn't shut the economy down. And I'm grateful to him for the, the input he's had. But I, you know, they mentioned that we toured the hospital and that was pretty sobering for me. It was to see the, the, 
the intensive care unit expand into the other areas and the other wings of the hospital and we're the statistics are using those beds today. What an incredible job the hospital has done to, to help us through this. I, you know, I, it comes close to home. I have two granddaughters. One is a respiratory therapist and one is a ER nurse. And, you know, it's pretty sobering to see those guys and humbling, scary to see them working with that every day. And, it's, you know, early on and through the summer, I don't know that I knew anybody that had COVID. And now today, I've had several friends that have died from it, acquaintances, and, and I know a lot of people that have had it and that have been hospitalized. And I'm thankful for the great hospital care we have in our area and this state. And thankful for those people that are giving the service we need to be cautious as we go into Christmas, Christmas Day, that we, you know, 30% of the places where this COVID is transmitted to other people is in our homes. And we need to, we need to be protective of, of our health in our homes. But I just leave with the folks that, in the hospitals, what an incredible job they've done, how dedicated they are and the long hours they work. You know, they suited me up with a COVID outfit as they moved in and out of these rooms and how they, they put this on and take it off many times during the day. It, it, it's just really an incredible, Dr. Carroll, thanks for your staff for, for how incredibly dedicated they are to the people of Utah. Thank you. Hi, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Um, I'm like Don that, you know, I echo the thanks to our legislative leadership, uh, both in the House and the Senate and the, and the executive branch of Governor Herbert and his staff. But more importantly, here in Southern Utah, you know, our medical people and I'm a medical professional, I'm a pharmacist. We own three pharmacies, uh, in two in Cedar, one in Richfield. One of our pharmacies is now doing the, the rapid testing. And so we've been involved with that. So it's been interesting for me to be involved on a number of different fronts. I sit on the hospital board here in Cedar City. You know, I'm a pharmacist. We have, we're involved in the treatment of patients. And then also having, uh, being a legislator. So, you know, it's, it's been quite involved and it's, a lot, it's really been busy. I've, I've tried to become a little bit of a COVID nerd, trying to learn as much as I can about the disease and, and about uh, other things that are going on and, and some, of the, some of the things that are being tested, some of the philosophies and some of the, the theories that are being tested. And it's really been intriguing to me. But um, I, like I say, I've been through the Cedar City Hospital a number of times because I'm here. We don't have a trauma center like they do here in Dixie with, you know, St. George Hospital. But, um, and so it was a really good opportunity for me to get with Dr. Carroll, uh, who's a family friend, and to go through the, through the hospital down there and, and look at it. it. You know, there's two, two takeaways that I had from that. One is uh, just the the toll it takes on those caregivers. And Dr. Carroll talked about the fact that when a patient passes away in the hospital, oftentimes that caregiver, that nurse and the physician are the only ones there. Uh, you know, a family usually can't come in. Uh, and so they're, they're there with that patient when that patient passes. And, and also how, what a strange disease it is that, uh, you know, one a person can be coherent and talking to you and 15 minutes later actually be, and be dead. Um, and the other thing is, been such a strange political climate around COVID. You know, whether it be about wearing a mask or all the, you know, the theories that you hear and these conspiracy theories that every patient is being is being coded as COVID, so the hospital can get more money. You know, and, and I asked Dr. Carroll about that, and uh, he said, well. We do get a little bit more, I think it's 30, 40 bucks a day from Medicare if, if that patient came in specifically for COVID. But if it's a secondary source, then no. But he says, put this in perspective. At the time that I went through, they have, and he mentioned they have 32 ICU beds, but they had 47 ICU patients. 
And he said, we had to convert one of our orthopedic wings into an ICU for COVID patients. And he said, now, if you compare the, the money we get from a COVID patient versus the money we would get off of that per bed off of the orthopedic wing, it's not even close. It's four or five times more with, with orthopedics. So, you know, I just, it's, it's been frustrating in a lot of ways to see the various uh, theories with social media and other things. The disease is real, uh, but I think that we need to keep a balance in our life, make sure that we're keeping the economy open and keeping people thriving and still going that way, but then also being protective. And so in our businesses, our, we're, we have retail businesses, and I, I appreciate the fact that just very seldom do you ever see a, patient, a person come into our store without a mask on. And so I think that backs up what Dr. Carroll said in his opening statement, that it does appear that people in Southern Utah are being more careful. So thanks. Thanks to everybody that uh, has been involved in this, especially with our hospital caregivers and others that are on that frontline care, whether they be in a nursing home or whether it be home health or, or whether they be in the hospital. So thanks. I don't know, Lance, if it's back to you, if it is, you're on mute, so. Yeah, the, the comment of uh, 2020, you're on mute. Um, and I was so eloquent too, so I apologize. <laughs> thank you, thank you uh, senators. Um, now we'll, we'll go to uh, the representatives. Let's, let's start with Representative Brooks, then we'll go to Representative Last, Representative Segneller, uh, Representative Ship, and Representative Snow. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I think the senators really articulated it, the situation well. So I just want to take a minute and um, have you tell your staff and personally tell each one of you, thank you so much for what you are doing. No matter what people think or say, the reality is that you're in the trenches and you're working hard. You're seeing the pain that's coming across people who are struggling with COVID, especially those that are, are suffering enough that they have to be in the hospital or struggling to breathe. I can't imagine um, that type of feeling or situation. So thank you for all of you and what you are doing. And thank you again to the administrators who are open and honest with us as we have questions come from constituents that um, question some of the data that we're able to go and double check and, and get real answers and take the time to um, understand the situation better. So thank you very much and hope you all can have a Merry Christmas even in this time of struggle. Thank you. Yeah, I'll join with everybody else and say thanks for the chance to be here. Uh, I'm not sure how much we can help going into the Christmas season, uh, encouraging people to uh, do what they can to help protect others, but uh, whatever we can offer, we're happy to do that. Uh, I'd also like to just recognize a few people and express gratitude uh, for them, I guess, uh, groups of people really because I think they've made such an amazing difference to uh, our state during this really challenging time. First of all, is the educators, uh, both public and higher ed. I mean, we've been able to keep our schools uh, going during this pandemic. And I know that it's put an incredible amount of pressure on the teachers and on the staff uh, at the schools. And I just wanna say thanks to all of them. Of course, I work at Dixie State University. I've seen it up close and personal. And uh, we've tried to stay open and keep our, keep our uh, students in class as much as possible. And I know that that's, that's been an incredible effort on the part of hundreds, thousands of people really throughout the state. Uh, also wanna recognize uh, businesses. I know many businesses are really hurting, uh, but it's been amazing to, to me to watch how businesses have adapted during this challenging time. I mean, there have really been some, some unlikely businesses that have been thriving during this period of time. And I think it's, uh, it's been amazing to watch the human ingenuity as people have tried to continue to serve the, their customers and, and the population of the state through their businesses. And I just encourage them to, to stay with it and to keep being creative and do what they can to support the economy in the state. Uh, my colleagues have talked about healthcare workers and uh, boy, we just, we really can't, can't say enough uh, about that. Of course, I come from a family of healthcare workers and uh, 
Uh, none of them have been too directly impacted because they're not working in the emergency room or in the ICU, but certainly we've, we've had our connection to it uh, indirectly through them. Um, and uh, like my colleagues, I had the chance to go through the hospital and, and to see firsthand what that looked like. Uh, and and uh, on the orthopedic floor, which has been converted into ICU beds, uh, then into a family friend, a young man who's a nurse, and uh, just had the chance to ask him, tell me about, tell me about a, a given day in the hospital and what's it like. And as others have said, uh, he talked about the, the challenge, the emotional challenge of working in that situation, not only putting on the gear every time you have to go in a room, but really being the contact that that patient has with the outside world. If a family wants to talk to that patient, they go through the nurse and the nurse is trying to, to uh, interpret back and forth, especially for those patients that can't talk, trying to set up FaceTime or Zoom or whatever. So they become technologists as well. And uh, I just want to express my gratitude from the administration all the way to the, to the aides that are, that are in the rooms and working with the patients. Uh, thank you so much for what you're doing. We really appreciate that. And uh, want to just say thanks to the citizens, especially of this area, who are doing what they can to help. That's been mentioned by my colleagues as well. Uh, I've been able to avoid COVID and to whatever extent that's been because it's the people around me have been careful. I just want to say thanks to them, but really thanks to our society. And I, I thank you on behalf of my, uh, my eight-year-old granddaughter that has cystic fibrosis and who is really at risk if she uh, has a problem with her respiratory system. I thank you on behalf of my mom who's 88 years old and uh, who, who we need to see to take care of and on, uh, on behalf of all of the other people who have any kind of health risks, uh, what, you, what we as a society are doing is helping and the little things that you do to try to protect yourself and others can be beneficial. As my colleagues have said, this is real. I had a neighbor recently who went into the hospital, was diagnosed with lung cancer on the Monday and died of COVID related illness on a Thursday. And uh, you know, those, those kinds of things are hard to see. And I just wanna express my gratitude to all of those who are doing what they can to make the situation better for those who are ill and for those who are helping to keep everybody safe. Thanks. Thank you. Um, just looking, I don't see um, Representative Seg Miller. Um, if you're there, go ahead and speak up quickly. Okay, he probably wasn't able to join us the last minute. If uh, Representative Ship would like to go next. Yes, thank you for this opportunity and really grateful for the opportunity I had of uh, taking the tour of the hospital there in St. George with uh, uh, Dr. Carroll. Dr. Carroll grew up around the corner from my family and so we know his family very well. Wonderful young man. And uh, <clears throat> it's been an interesting uh, dynamic over the last several months. Uh, I know when this initially happened and, and masks and things were recommended uh, around Cedar City, we didn't see a lot of people really complying with that and didn't think it was necessary, but uh, even just today, as I went for lunch and recently I've noticed, uh, and, I'm, and I'm grateful for these community members that are, are wearing their masks and, and social distancing that will really help. It's, uh, it's a sobering thing. My family, we were, had been planning for the last uh, almost year to get together everybody for Thanksgiving. I have a son that lives in Washington, D.C. I have a daughter and her family that live in uh, Oregon, and then most of the rest of them, uh, besides the one that lives at home with us, that I have four that live on the Wasatch Front. And so as it came close to Thanksgiving, uh, and uh, we decided, and everybody decided, well, we, we, better, we better stay at home uh, so that we don't run the risk of spreading this to family members and those around us. And so it ended up being my wife and I and our one son that's just graduated from SUU. We spent uh, Thanksgiving together, the three of us, and, 
And so it was not what we wanted or anticipated, but I am grateful that my own family and my kids decided, hey, we need to do our part in helping to control this pandemic. So I'm grateful for them. I'm grateful for the community members that have stepped up and, and uh, are doing their part. And I know there's, uh, through social media, there's those naysayers out there that are uh, saying that, you know, this, this is an infringement on our freedom. Uh, you know, this isn't that, that uh, critical. Uh, I'm glad that most of the people are not listening to those uh, things. I was sobered. Uh, it was a sobering thing when I went to the hospital and saw that at that time, a couple of weeks ago, it was 99% full. COVID, uh, the ICU was 150% full. And, and it really makes you realize that it's, it's a real thing and, and appreciate all the healthcare workers and their efforts. And a lot of them I know are very exhausted from what they're doing and that they, they are doing it in a wonderful way. So with that, uh, I just want to wish you a Merry Christmas. Grateful for the leadership of the House. Speaker Wilson has done some, uh, been very involved and done some things as well as the rest of the rest of the leadership in the Senate as well. And we appreciate all of you, community members. We appreciate you, hospital workers, and what you're doing. So thank you for letting me say a few words. I guess it's uh, I guess it's my turn. Uh, let me um, also begin by uh, thanking uh, Dr. Carroll and those who you work uh, with for calling this uh, event and allowing uh, lawmakers to speak. Um, and thank you, Dr. Carroll, for uh, giving us an opportunity to tour uh, your facility, the hospital. Uh, like everyone else who has spoken today, um, when you actually see it and you talk to the medical providers, uh, those that are working there, and you find out what, uh, to what lengths we've had to take in our community to provide for those who are ill and suffering from this, uh, it is sobering. Uh, and also, uh, as you count the numbers we've lost uh, in our state and in Southern Utah, and uh, some of those represent people that we know, um, it's real. Uh, and the pandemic has taken people's lives uh, and, and we need to continue to be vigilant. Um, lots of folks or lots of my colleagues have uh, conveyed uh, thanks to our, our frontline providers, our medical providers. Uh, I would like to, to express my thanks as well uh, to, to everyone that has helped uh, contain this pandemic, but especially today, uh, I want to thank uh, the people in the community in Southern Utah and all over the state, but Southern Utah where we see it. I've noticed uh, like, uh, like uh, Representative Ship, that there seems to be a change uh, in the climate and the attitude. I see more people willingly put on their masks. I see more people willingly to make sacrifices. This was a hard Thanksgiving for my wife and I because this was supposed to be the one in rotation when we had all of our six children, all of the grandchildren, and there's, no, uh, there's nothing quite like getting everyone under uh, your roof on Thanksgiving for Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, and, and giving that up and sacrificing that was hard, um, but we too felt like that it was a sacrifice that we needed to make to do our part. And I know we weren't alone. I've talked to so many families, so many parents, who did the same thing. I talked to so many uh, elderly people living in my neighborhood who expressed uh, some sorrow of being alone for Thanksgiving, but at the same breath said, we wanted to do whatever was necessary uh, to do our part. So I express sincere thank you to the citizens uh, who have stepped up. And Dr. Carroll, you were correct, I think, when you said you anticipated a, a surge after uh, the Thanksgiving holiday. We talked about that when we toured the hospital and you uh, showed us what arrangements were being made to accommodate that surge. Uh, but I think it was because of citizens stepping up and trying to do the right thing uh, that helped us uh, uh, contain that in a, in a way that we perhaps didn't anticipate. 
Last thing I want to say is uh, what a great miracle uh, that we are now looking at people receiving the vaccine in our country, in our state. Uh, and to think that this has been accomplished within less than a year's time uh, is nothing short of a miracle. And I think we owe a lot of gratitude uh, to, um, in my opinion, to help on high, divine help in helping us uh, to meet this challenge. Uh, so there's light at the end of the tunnel, um, but as I've talked to uh, so many people, our leaders, and those involved uh, in the hospital, uh, we can't let down our guard. We need to remain vigilant until we can all receive the vaccine and all be protected. And I'm confident that we can do that through the Christmas holidays, through the holiday season, uh, because that's the kind of commitment I, I think that we receive from our citizens. Uh, so with that, uh, and with a sincere um, uh, comment of appreciation to the citizens that have stepped up and who have done their part, uh, uh, I, I just uh, can't tell you enough how much we appreciate that. And there are thousands of people who we will never know who have been benefited uh, by our willingness to make sacrifices they didn't get sick, we didn't lose a loved one, uh, and um, we just need to continue to be vigilant. Thank you for allowing me to make a comment or two. Thank you to each of you. Um, I believe uh, Dr. Carroll had a couple last comments and then we'll go to Dr. Daskin. Dr. Carroll, you're muted. Thank you, Lance. Uh, appreciate you catching me on that. Um, appreciate the opportunity to have it uh, take just a couple couple more minutes. Um, I'd like to express my appreciation to Dr. Blodgett and the Southwest Utah Public Health Department. Um, they are putting in a tremendous amount of work um, that really goes unnoticed. Um, virtually all of it, or much of it at least, behind the scenes that that we don't see occurring. Um, and and that's that's important work that is uh, that continues. So thank you to Dr. Blodgett uh, and his team. And um, as Ben mentioned, we have converted uh, different beds in the hospital to different uh, different uh, type of care for COVID patients. Our 32 bed ICU has expanded um, onto the same floor into other ICU beds. Um, our our unit, our orthopedic unit on the four, fourth floor, has been converted into an all COVID unit. Uh, currently where uh, where patients are being cared for. Um, in addition to the to the COVID patients that uh, come into our labor and delivery unit, our behavioral health unit, um, that we're taking extra precautions for um, while not treating COVID directly per se, but ma managing COVID for those patients um, with their other disease processes that are that are ongoing and um, or other conditions that we're we're treating. Um, I would I would simply like to end um, by asking you to join me in continuing the work that, that you're doing. Join me in uh, your Christmas celebrations like you did for Thanksgiving to enjoy those with your immediate family. And we can have a wonderful Christmas as well. Um, Lance, I'm gonna take the liberty, if it's okay, to introduce Dr. Daskin. Dr. Daskin has done a phenomenal job. I'm so happy to be able to work with her, um, an infectious disease specialist and um, a physician within the Intermountain System that has let out on infection prevention and employee health and helping to keep us and our patients and our community safe. Um, we are extremely lucky to, to have her. And um, uh, Dr. Daskam, over to you. And you two are on mute, Dr. Daskam. Amazing how that works. I'm apparently not good enough to match the wits with technology, but thank you so much. For that very warm introduction. Um, Intermountain Healthcare is grateful to be able to announce that we have now vaccinated approximately 5,000 of our caregivers. This is done by appointment only to ensure that we are creating a safe environment for our caregivers due to COVID, ensure social distancing, ensure um, that we have everyone accounted for and can get their follow-up vaccination as well. Remembering that we also have to monitor folks afterwards. So we want to make sure we have enough space for everyone to have uh, safety during COVID. At the end of the day, because we are using the Pfizer vaccine, as you may have heard, 
Sometimes we are able to get extra doses. Our pharmacists are very adept at being efficient and using every possible means to be able to access those opportunities. Uh, we have had extra doses affiliated with our vials. And we are also grateful to note that our caregivers have been exceptionally accepting of the vaccine, so much so that at the end of the day, we always have extra caregivers to be able to give those extra doses to. So we are planning on continuing specifically to vaccinate our caregivers at this time, ensuring that we can do that in as rapid as, a, as possible, as rapidly as possible as we can. Rather than having these, um, and these small amounts go to waste or having to have them be thrown away, we would much rather be able to give access to caregivers that are interested in that access. Over time, we are looking forward to expanding our uh, hospital access to the Moderna vaccine uh, and other vaccines that come along and um, getting our caregivers and ultimately our community uh, this type of protection along with the protection of masking as our community develops immunity together. This may be a while and we will still need um, to ensure that uh, we are being protected during that time. To clarify, I apologize for masking, but it is important. I am in a room with other caregivers. Uh, we have now vac vaccinated approximately 5,000 of our caregivers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Daskin. And now, as is usual, we'll go ahead and open for questions. If you would um, please um, unmute yourself, introduce um, yourself, and then um, ask your question. And if it's directed to someone specifically, uh, go ahead and do so. Hi, this is Chris Reed with St. George News, and good to see everybody again. Um, I'd like to actually uh, start off by directing a question towards uh, certainly um, either Representative Snow, uh, State Senator Vickers, whoever represents the Cedar City area. Um, we. We had late October um, where Cedar City had gone down for a little bit, so the mask requirement was lifted. And leaders had been pushing for the area to quote unquote go green back when we had that color system. Then the November surge came, and at this point, Cedar City's new infections on one day equaled St. George's, and they're still experiencing a rise. Was it a mistake to take the foot off the brake pedal in that case? I don't know if uh, Senator Vickers wants to. Sorry, uh, I apologize. So, or, Chris, ahead. just give me no the uh, give me the question real quick again. Just to, well, I heard part of sure, it. Sure, and, and, and not a problem. Well, yeah, basically, uh, you know, late October the mask requirement was lifted in Cedar City, um, and I know that. And certainly, uh, Senator Vickers, you were certainly um, a proponent for a long time of of the area going green, um, and then the November surge came. And I, I guess I'm asking in retrospect, and we, you know, we all play Monday morning quarterback. Was it a mistake to, yeah, was it a mistake to take that foot off the brake pedal at that point? No, I think that, I think that surge was going to come no matter what happened. Um, I've always been a proponent, and this is just my personal belief. I should, I don't believe, I really don't like mandates. And I, uh, myself and others tend to uh, respond better if we're given a choice. I, I always like to educate and give people a choice. And I felt like that people were doing that anyway. Uh, we were a proponent of going green because uh, we wanted to make sure that our economy was rolling and that people were being treated. I, no, I don't think it was a mistake because quite frankly, I think that that surge was gonna come whether whether everybody was wearing a mask or they weren't, you know, I think it by wearing masks, it, it minimized it. So at least that's my thought. Rex, you might have a different opinion on that. I don't know. Yeah, I can just make a comment to that as well. Uh, the numbers didn't seem to uh, justify masks at one time. And, uh, and so I think it was the right call to try and not have it be a mandate at the time. But uh, certainly things have changed in a big way since then. And, and I think it's pretty important right now to, to, to be doing that and to wearing a mask and social distancing and so forth. Thanks.
Thank you. Uh, next question. Hi, this is Haley Hendricks with ABC4 News. Um, this question is for one of our healthcare professionals. So the state of Utah, along with other national research, has created vaccine trackers online for the public to see how many vaccines have been administered daily. So what value do these vaccine trackers add to health officials and that data there, and even the public? This is Dr. Daskin, I can answer that question. Um, there is a vaccine tracker on um, our state health department site. It does quantify the number of vaccines that have been administered and reported back to the state. We as a system are supporting that by um, reporting the number of vaccines we have administered at the end of the day. This also helps us keep in compliance so that the state knows how many vaccines we administer so that they can supply us with the second dose for our caregivers and ultimately our community. Um, this should help our state with further planning that helps them know how many caregivers have been have administered. They know how many caregivers there are. They also have, are starting the process of planning each age group, for example, or those with comorbidities to ensure that we are getting um, enough vaccine over time planned ahead. So as we, if they know how much is being utilized, they can plan ahead to ensure that the next cohort is ready for a rapid vaccine administration. So I think in terms of the public's benefit, um, it will ultimately lead to rapid vaccine dis dissemination um, and benefit to our community. Thank you so much for that. If I might add to that uh, briefly as well, I think one of the things that we have to be cautious about is we run the risk as a society of seeing that number go up and, and think that we're um, safer than we actually are. It's important to remember that you know the state of Utah has you know over three million um, residents, and so it's super exciting to see vaccines roll out. And I agree with uh, Representative Snow that this is you know nothing short of a miracle to have this have this occur as quickly as it did. When we see five thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand, fifty thousand um, individuals uh, vaccinated on that tracker as that goes up. We need to put that in perspective. Um, I did I did a calculation recently for southern for southern Utah for Washington County, and calculated that we were at 0.25 percent of our population vaccinated. I'm super happy that that, that occurred. Um, we're this is this is the beginning. We're not at the end yet, and so we need to continue to do what it, what we're doing um, while we while we work through this process to give everybody the opportunity to be vaccinated that would like the vaccine. Thank you for sharing. This is Chris again. If I can follow up on Haley's question, um, and maybe Dr. Carroll may be more uh, easily able to answer this than Dr. Daskin, but it's good to see her. Um, do we know how many of uh, Dixie Regional's caregivers specifically have been vaccinated at this point? And are we getting close to the point? Um, like, when are we going to be at the point where we feel like, okay, we've got the frontline caregivers taken care of, and I know that teachers were supposed to be uh, next up on the vaccinations. Um, when are we going to be at that point where we move on to the next uh, phase, so to speak, of vaccinations? Yeah, excellent question, Chris. Um, we um, in St. George have received, uh, or at and Dixie Regional Medical Center have received 975 uh, vaccinations. As, as Dr. Daska mentioned, um, our pharmacists are able to draw up the, um, the right dose of vaccine for more than five doses. So we have, uh, we have administered um, just shy of 600 um, vaccines at this point in, in St. George. And um, those have been given to, care work, to our caregivers that are at the highest risk. So, um, caregivers that work in the ICU, caregivers that are working with COVID positive patients. That includes physicians, that includes nurses, that includes our um, environmental services um, workers that are cleaning the rooms, that includes our food services workers that are delivering food um, to, to COVID positive patients. It includes our emergency department and a, and a host of other, other individuals and, and groups. And so we've been very deliberate and very thoughtful um, under Dr. Daston's leadership and others to, to have a, a consistent process as we, as we work through this. 
Um, I can't tell you, Chris, how many um, physicians have reached out to me that are not in uh, the that it's not their turn yet, and saying, uh, "Dr. Carroll, when do I when do I get my turn?" Um, our physicians um, have have read the research. Our physicians have looked at the data, and they're excited uh, to get this vaccine, and they are getting this vaccine. Uh, to answer your question about about school teachers and others in the community. Um, um, I don't have a date, although um, I know that Dr. Blodgett and the health department is working diligently uh, to uh, to get those uh, to get those plans underway. Um, I um, in my let me switch hats for a second. My role as uh, a member of a school board um, here in St. George, and um, we've been in in conversations uh, to get the teachers of that school immunized um, uh, as well. And, and those, those plans are, are underway, um, led by the, the health department um, with Dr. Blodgett and team. Any other questions? I have actually, uh, I guess uh, one more, and this will go. Um, uh, certainly, uh, Don, you, you, uh, you, uh, Don Epsom, you, you had a very emotional statement where you, you talked about taking that tour and it being a real wake up call. What kind of things did it change in your own mind about where this pandemic has been going? And as far as the, uh, you know, a lot of the people who were frankly uh, anti-mask are now, they're the same people now emailing me about uh, being anti-vaccine. Is, is, is that something that, as far as the anti-vaccine movement, um, will that be a detriment to getting everyone vaccinated? Well, I think it will. And I, you know, I'm concerned. I, and I, certainly anyone's right to, to not be vaccinated. But you know, I re I'm, I'm old enough that I remember polio. I remember measles. We eradicated those through vaccination. And people still don't want to do it. Throughout the world, we, we push to have people inoculated, vaccinated for measles. And that's just another step in, in trying to make the world healthier to curb a pandemic that, frankly, when it's my turn, I want to have it. And I, I have a hard time understanding in my own mind why people wouldn't want to be vaccinated. The, the science is there. The, the, they've tested it. It works. It's like a flu shot. Uh, some do, some don't. And I... It, I just would encourage everyone to really give it a lot of thought and no one's making you do anything. It's not trying to take freedoms away from you. We're not forcing the, the world's not forcing it on you, but I would hope that people would volunteer to when it's their turn to step up and take it and help protect their neighbor from it moving from person to person. And if I can follow up with Dr. Carroll, um, you know, you, you mentioned today uh, hospitalizations. I think you said 67. Um, and you know, there's been, so to speak, a breakdown in terms of new infections. Are we still dealing with that surge from November at this point? And is it? It's got to be emotionally draining as already as it already has been for the caregivers. Um, that they, it doesn't seem like they have gotten a break. Yeah, uh, great question. The, um, the number of cases that we see, or the number of hospitalizations we see, we know take time. That, that doesn't happen immediately after, after infections. And it's, it's what we call a lagging measure. And so that's what we're, that's what we're seeing. Um, and there's no question, this is, you know, this is um, difficult for the caregivers that are coming in. 
those that are working mandatory um, overtime or volunteering consistently for um, for extra shifts. Um, more uh, more challenging than that, however, is as I go into the uh, ICU and I talk to to Dr. Ferguson or I talk to uh, the nurses in the in the ICU to ask them how they're doing. Uh, I can see it. I can see it in their eyes and uh, in their voices what they, they tell me how difficult it difficult it is when they when they lose patients. Um, our caregivers care about each patient they're taking care of. This is more than a job for them. This is something that they chose to do with their life, and this is something that they genuinely care about the patients that they're uh, that they're taking care of. Um, so when they have a patient come in that despite their best effort, despite trying everything that they can, that um, they see a patient that, um, had, that had years of life left um, succumb to this illness, that's, that's more difficult than, than the high census. That's more difficult than, um, than a lot of patients coming in. We want to prevent, um, to, uh, prevent the, the devastating effects. We want to prevent, prevent death. We do it. Um, we do it to some degree in the hospital. Collectively, as a society, we do it much better by preventing illness than when the patient ends up in the hospital. And again, my my thanks and gratitude to the community that did choose to celebrate the Thanksgiving season um, with their immediate family under their household, rather than their extended family or friend. It did make a difference. We see that. And doing the same thing for Christmas will make a difference. Um, um, I will be doing that in my family and I would ask you to join with me as we do that. This won't last forever, but it will last a bit longer. And uh, doc, Dr. Kara, one more quick follow-up and, and I wanna go on the positive side here. When you mentioned about seeing in the caregiver's eyes when they lose a patient, what about those times when a person's being wheeled out, they're heading to the lobby, um, they were at one point in the ICU, they were at one point on a ventilator, and they're leaving the hospital. Tell me about the emotion of that situation. Yeah, we had a, we had a couple in the, in the hospital um, a couple of, oh, a month or two ago, and, um, and one, one uh, member of this couple, one individual did not survive. The other did, the other left the hospital. And um, several weeks or months later, had a um, had a significant life event. When the caregivers found out about that, the way that they celebrated, it was as if it was their own family member they were celebrating with. They had created a connection with this individual. They had created a connection with this uh, with this family, and those successes are something that helps keep our caregivers going. Thank you, and I think uh, Christina Flores has a question. You know what, she responded in the chat that she had to step out and leave, so um, if there's no further questions, um, we'll go ahead and wrap up today. All right, thank you everybody for joining us. We will go ahead. Thank you all so much. Thank you, honored to be here. We'll go ahead and process the video and get it out to everybody. We've also got some... I'm sorry, was that uh, someone? No? Okay, we'll go ahead and get the video processed as well as um, we've got some B-roll and some other photos that we'll be sharing as well afterwards. So thank Thanks everybody. Thank everyone for joining us.